Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches English Language and Literature A-Level. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Martin Hoyle's review of television drama, The Bridge. This is taken from the Voices in Speech and Writing anthology. I'll take you through the content, some ideas to do with the context, genre, audience and purpose, and then we'll get stuck into the text, looking at how we're going to describe Martin Hoyle's voice as he persuades us to uh, watch an episode or two of The Bridge. So let's get started. Okay, so this is a review that was in the uh, Financial Times. Martin Hoyle is uh, quite a famous critic, uh, TV, radio and film. Uh, you won't necessarily know of him by name, but you'll certainly recognise one of the platforms that he reviews on, which is the Rotten Tomatoes. And of course, other publications like The Independent and the FT. Clearly, this particular review of The Bridge is, is in the FT. But I just want to illustrate to you that, you know, he he is a well-considered uh, reviewer um, and so this particular review as it is um, headed pick of the week it gives uh, him a little bit of credibility if it's Martin Hoyle's pick of the week then it's going to be worth having a little look at because he has reviewed his fair few of TV dramas and films um, something else you need to be aware of uh, contextually is the real rise in popularity in Scandinavian drama or Nordic noir, um, and that is both on television and uh, in novels as well. So things like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, for example, uh, was one of the... Um, sort of first uh, text that got really like you know that was really really successful um, and translated into English and also watched with subtitles it's a BBC4 drama it is of course subtitle subtitled um, you can see here the picture I've got for you is the uh, is Bron rather than the bridge which is obviously the translated so one of the things that you might want to be aware of is some of the conventions for Nordic noir, noir or Sc Scandinavian noir uh, so you you're definitely going to accept expect sorry uh, brutal crimes um, often in uh, communities or neighborhoods where there shouldn't be brutal crimes so places that are supposed to be quite peaceful um, maybe bleak settings is uh, quite a commonality of Nordic noir um, the kind of troubled protagonist um, normally a detective um, because obviously these are crime thrillers and you're going to expect there to be a really, really strong plot, very, very complex with lots of threads, uh, different threads running through and some pretty decent twists. So that's what we're looking for in terms of Nordic Noir. OK, so thinking about our genre audience and purpose, obviously, this is a print review uh, published in the Financial Times, uh, the weekend edition. So it's slightly more relaxed, but Financial Times is a broadsheet. So we are looking at an educated audience, certainly fans of Hoyle um, and actually those just interested in that review section. So people that are into watching television, um, but certainly people that are interested in Scandinavian noir or Nordic noir, people that watch police detective series in general. And you you're going to have that um, following as well. So this review is for season two. So you're going to have those people looking in that have watched season one and want to know whether it's going to be good because everyone has that fear, don't they, when they really like a series and the next one comes out and phew, it's a bit of a, uh, a bummer. So um, you're going to have those people tuning in as well. Now, uh, Hoyle's uh, presentation of this material, his uh, opinion of the uh, the bridge is wildly positive. So actually, in terms of his purpose, if there is a persuade element. He wants you to watch it. He wants you to get hooked into it. And always we are trying to sell copies of the FT um, uh, weekend. So we're going to be informing and we're going to be entertaining in those ways. So getting straight into looking at the opening, thinking about voice. Uh, like I said, uh, it is a very positive voice. It is evaluative, which you would expect uh, from a review. And this opening is quite dramatic. It certainly packs a punch, which is what you'd expect from the beginning of a re review because you want to hook your audience. So it meets a convention straight away. We open in present tense with a declarative sentence or two declarative sentences uh, linked together. Saturday is complete again. Scandinavian noir is back. So that's a really kind of bold move. We've got the hyperbole here in uh, Saturday is complete again, suggesting that without the bridge, um, 
or without Scandinavian noir, I should say, he feels incomplete. And finally, Saturdays are great again uh, because it's back. Notice he does say Scandinavian noir is back, not the bridge is back. Um, and these adverbials, again, are rooted in what has been and what is now again. Uh, complete again is back. Now, we've got some exophoric referencing here. So he says, after the civilised machinations of Danish politics and Borgen, we plunge into the dark world. So let's just look first of all with uh, at this um, subordinate clause. So the civilised machinations of Danish politics and Borgen, this is another text. This isn't in relation to the bridge. This is another piece of Scandinavian noir. So what he's actually doing, these exophoric references, he is expecting you to know about other types of Nordic noir and be able to compare and go, oh yeah, yeah, that one was, that was quite civilised. And then he juxtaposes, he contrasts that notion of civilised politics with the kind of grit and the darkness of the bridge. And that is immediately started with this verb, we plunge into the dark world of terrorism, mass killing and poisonous grudges. Just start stop there for a second so we've got this triad that is um semantic field of death uh, or crime here um absolutely and it is justified with this adjective dark so um again in contrast to the other bit of Sc scandinavian noir he was describing um uh, poisonous grudges underlying humane orderly nordic society so notice how that semantic field of death or violence is juxtaposed with this notion of order um, and control the humane the orderly nordic society so he's drawing attention to the kind of parallels and the juxtapositions within the show as you will remember is a form of uh, a convention of the form this idea of brutal murders happening in places that are quiet and calm and peaceful that kind of juxtaposition okay we continue we get a bit factual now and we get a bit summative because we are continuing to meet the form the conventions of the form of the review so the second season of the bridge uh, uh, BBC 4 9 p.m. resumes 13 months after the story of the first ended. So in present tense, we're going into facts. Those facts are added to in our parenthesis here, which gives us time and place. Um, resumes 13 months after the story of the first ended with an opening less gruesome, but just as eerie. So further sort of exophoric references because it's expecting you to remember what happened in season one. And we are again reminded of those conventions of Nordic noir. Uh, so we, even though it's gruesome, there is a kind of sort of eeriness to it. And then we get straight into the description of the crime. Five drugged youngsters found chained on board. Um, so here what we have is we've got some narrative hooks because we're getting enough of the plot to kind of whet our appetites, but without going too far and it's used as a way of linking in to those characters that people that have seen series one will recognize so trigger more danish swedish police co cooperation hurrah for the chalk and cheese combination of frowsy easygoing martin and the unsmiling briskly robotic asperger's ish uh, sa uh, saga so slight shift in tone here i should put another one up here because we move into a much more informal tone uh we've got this interjection hurrah and we've got this idiomatic phrase chalk and cheese combo uh, nicely alliterative there as well demonstrating the differences between these two characters and then he qualifies what those differences are with this ace and dis asyndetic listing of adjectives so frowsy easy going um so again very kind of laid back in martin and then here we have unsmiling briskly robotic aspergerish saga um so again another um asyndetic list of adjectives with a nice uh, little um adverb here as well and we've got a sort of coined adjective here playing on the word Asperger's by saying ish, i.e. perhaps she's on the spectrum, but not necessarily diagnosed. Very, very informal uh, to add the suffix of ish onto Asperger's. Um, sticking with this particular character, so in this kind of summation of the uh, characters, 
um, Hoyle becomes very, very descriptive in tone. And he's really playing with language here. So you can see his skill as a writer. Uh, another asyndetic list uh, of adjectives. Saga's antiseptic, angular, preeminently logical psyche. Uh, so we've got uh, low frequency Lexus here, appealing to that educated readership, um, but we're also quite sort of subtly metaphorical in our lists as well, because we're describing uh, this character's psyche as being antiseptic, so quite clinical. Uh, we're describing it as being angular, so quite hard. And then we move into uh, a more straightforward um, adjective adjective here logical but it is intensified by this adverb preeminently logical um, which means in particular so he's been quite detailed in terms of describing the characteristics of this character uh, so her psyche is disturbed by her efforts at normal relationships so continuing to develop those descriptions she has learnt to detect when people are making jokes so I think the past perfect tense here, she has learnt, again, it's reminding us of the previous struggles of the character and perhaps um, aspects of her character from season one. And then this verb is pretty interesting here. She's learnt to detect when people are making jokes. So it's ever so slightly word playery here. Word playery, that's not a phrase. Um, he's playing on um, language which is to do with police detection work, but in this case, her detecting is about trying to identify humour. So it's a much more kind of personal use of the word. Um, and then it shows what she has done in order to address when people are making jokes, laughing heartily, even if it is unconvincingly. Um, her, when Martin gently points out that this is unnecessary. And I just drew attention to this little adverb of manner. There are plenty of adverbs of manner, again, adding to characterization. But we're, we're showing here that juxtaposition between the characters. It's another way of demonstrating the chalk and cheese nature of them. If she is angular and antiseptic, he's gentle in the way that he deals with her. So we're being um, reminded of the kind of dynamic between the two characters here as well. So note the way that we're using lots of references that are to do with the show, but without giving too much away. It's more about reminding us of why it's so great. And then just looking at that last bit, you know, I never look at everything. I've looked quite a lot on this one. OK, so we've got this collective noun. Saturday's brace of episodes uh, is rich with subplots, vivid subsidiary characters and a reminder that even mass terrorism can be rooted in a skewed world picture of one unbalanced human. What a punchy start to the ending. So this triadic structure that we've got uh, here, starting with rich with subplots, and then moving down to here. Um, this is drawing attention to the complexity of the show. So it's saying this is good Nordic noir. It does what it's meant to. It gives us more than one kind of set of characters. We're going to get a lot of them. They're all going to be just as good um, as the two detectives, that there are going to be subplots. And then we're reminded of some of the key concerns um, of the show, linking back to the introduction where it talked about the notion of terrorism. Um, but we've got a little bit of a narrative hook here in this description of the skewed world picture of an one unbalanced human. So we're being given a little narrative hook about the antagonist of the show, but again, without giving too much away. And here is where, so I've said here as well as, yeah, very, very positive, very evaluative, but we get this really kind of educated Lexis here, very, uh, very polysyllabic, low frequency Lexis that appeals to the reader. And again, it's another sign of um, Hoyle's prowess and skill as a writer. Uh, look at all of the juxtapositions here. There emerges a common theme. Nice declarative. Uh, um, little colon introduces now these common themes connection the failure to connect so our first juxtaposition the fear of abandonment and isolation and the nordic thrillers paradoxical juxtaposition of high principles and violent action another juxtaposition efficiency and murderousness another juxtaposition so 
He's really going to town in pointing out the complexities of this show. And then he sums it up with a, it's this final summative statement. And note the contrast. Again, he's using juxtaposition himself. What a legend. Um, we've got this incredibly detailed long sentence um, here. It is actually a simple sentence. It's just incredibly long. OK. Um, and then we get this very short, simple sentence. The dark is all pervasive. So it's simple. It's declarative. It's full of hyperbole. It suggests that this underlying darkness of the show, you can see it and feel it absolutely everywhere. So what a brilliant hook to make you want to go and watch that show. That's it from me. I hope that was useful and not too much of a rush. Um, do give me a shout if you uh, want any more information on either the content or the context. Just drop me a line in the comments and I will get back to you. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. Happy revising.